All right, we're back, and let's talk about death and or dying and acceptance of death. Um, so, in the um, hospice field or in the um, grief field, we oftentimes talk about a good death versus a bad death. If you ask people the characteristics of a good death, they will typically give a list like this. They want their death to be peaceful, quick, painless, um, after a long life well lived, the people who I know and love me around me, and in familiar surroundings. And most will describe a bad death as a death that's missing any of those elements, maybe one that has um, added the element of you know, fear that goes along with something being acutely wrong and you're in a medical situation and, and things like that. And especially older people really dread the idea that they might end up um, having a protracted death that is um, you know, anonymous and medicalized and things like that. So good death versus bad death. Now, of course, um, you know, it's in the eye of the beholder in a lot of ways, but I think most people agree that they wouldn't want to be in a really medicalized situation. Um, Elizabeth Kubler-Ross generated a list of stages that in her grief counseling, it appeared that people went through, and she thought in a particular order. Um, I've linked in our classroom a little clip showing Homer Simpson going through the five stages of death in like 20 seconds. Um, so if you want to watch that, it's kind of funny. Uh, but here are the stages. So she said that first, when people find out that they are terminally ill, whether it's you know very acute and it's not going to last long, or you know that they've got years to live, first thing people tend to go through is denial. I'm not really dying. You've this has to be wrong. The test was wrong. Anger is next. And, uh, you know, it sort of varies who gets blamed in the anger phase. And, a and in fact, the person might blame a variety of different people across their, their illness. So anger could be targeting anyone and then or anything. And then there's bargaining. If you just let me live through this, I'll be good from now on. Things like that. Depression, where nothing matters anymore. Um, not only am I dying, but I don't want to talk to anybody. I don't care what I eat. I don't care. And then finally, acceptance, where the person comes to a conclusion that you know, death is part of life and you know, I'm at the end of mine. OK, so Kubler-Ross thought that these were the five stages and that people progressed through them in very much a linear fashion. And that. One way to ensure a bad death, in her mind, was to skip a step or, ne or never ultimately get to acceptance. A lot of people have criticized her for saying those, that, because not everybody gets through all the same stages. Some people get stuck in one stage, so anger, let's say, um, something like that, and never move past it, or depression, and they never move past it. And you know, when a person's been told that they're, that they're going to die, I mean, should we really be judging them for the way that they're coping with the news? And so um, some people have really discounted Kubler-Ross's stages and have said, That's a, it's just like one more burden that you've given people, that this is what they're supposed to be doing. Um, instead of expecting people to move through stages in a predictable fashion, um, you know, we need to have an on, honest conversation. The truth is, we may not reach all the stages in the same order if we're given a terminal diagnosis. We may never get to all the stages. I think in a certain way, uh, Kubler-Ross kind of assumes that we, go through, that we all go through the five stages as we live, and that by the time we're in old age, we're supposed to be at acceptance, right? Where we're willing to accept the fact that we're, like, that we're gonna die eventually, and, and, and so we should die with dignity like that. But, um, not all of us get there. Not all of us go through these stages the way that, that she described. And so, for example, if you have a person who's been given a terminal diagnosis, like in this case, um, breast cancer, um, are, are you in denial or are you um, in the anger phase if you're not willing to just move on to acceptance and die, right? I mean, it really makes you wonder exactly um, what it means and what she expects of people um, to get through it. Some dying people want to know the truth about their condition, and they really want to know, like, what's the likelihood that I'm going to survive this? Um, 
you know, how long do I have? What will be the, the things I go through and wh what's it gonna feel like? You know, some people just like the bare knuckles truth about their condition. Other people wanna hear, you know, well, you know, you're gonna be feeling good right up till the end and, and you know, more of a rosy outlook. Some people don't really wanna be told all the details. And so it's really difficult for people who are taking care of people who have a terminal condition to figure out which kind of patient do I have in front of me right now. Do I have a person who wants to hear all the truth or do they think they want to hear all the truth and then when they start to hear it, they may panic, right? So it's really difficult to know what kind of person is, you know, going through the grief counseling right now. Pretty much everybody who has heard that their life is, has got sort of an end point in front of them want to spend time with their loved ones. They might want to reconcile, um, you know, old arguments or get over them or have a family reunion or, or something like that. Um, now, staying on the dying and acceptance topic, um, sometimes a person has been given a diagnosis of an illness that can't be cured. It, it doesn't, we don't know how long it could last necessarily, but it, it's not gonna get cured. You're not gonna, you're not gonna live through this illness. Um, and so there's a, a way of treating that called palliative care, where basically you, you manage the symptoms um, and help keep the person as comfortable as you can, but recognizing that this illness is probably ultimately going to shorten your life. With hospice care, which is a subset of palliative care, we have symptom management and comfort care at the end of life. And so with hospice care, we're going to focus on a person who has got a terminal condition. Um, in, to be eligible for hospice care, you have um, no more than six weeks left to live in your diagnosis. So hospice care is very much targeted towards people who are at the very end of their lives and trying to keep them as comfortable as they can as they approach the end. So I wanted to talk a little bit about hospice care. Um, so just to repeat, terminally ill patients receive palliative care through hospice care. Um, one of the things that happens with hospice care is that you get this double effect. It's, an, it's really this ethical situation that, that arises in hospice care. Um, my my brother-in-law is a hospice nurse and he and I spoke about this ethical consideration that he was going through as a hospice nurse and it's really common. Um, you know, oftentimes in order to be comfortable at the end of life, uh, opiates are prescribed so that the person doesn't have to feel the pains that are going along with whatever's killing them. Um, so they administer opiates to relieve the pain, but it can hasten the death. It, you know, the, the body can overdose on opiates. It can cause you to stop breathing, the heart rate to slow too, too much, and so it can actually hasten death. And I know my brother-in-law was like very concerned about um, a change that occurred in his hospice um, program where as an RN, he now was in charge of deciding the dosage for his patients. And he was very concerned that he was gonna accidentally overdose a patient, but he's so empathetic that he really wants his patients to be comfortable. And so uh, he, he really was struggling with that when, when this was put in, into his responsibility. It's been a few years and he seems to be doing really well with it. He seems to be very confident now that he's, he's administering doses that are appropriate for comfort. And, and then the thing is, he has honest conversations with his patients. And that's the important thing is to talk to patients and family members about exactly this issue, that we have medications that will make the patient more comfortable, but this could ultimately be speeding the end. And so do you want to be in dis a little bit of discomfort and live longer, or do you want to be comfortable and it might be shorter? Um, hospice care is usually a multidisciplinary team of experts. And what's really nice is that most counties have a hospice program available for all people to, to use. Um, and it can, it, there's an overall medical director usually for the program. Usually the patient has their own physician, but hospice can provide one. Um, there's a, a nurse who will come to the house or a CNA that will come to the house, which is a certified nursing assistant. Um, there are other therapies, therapists who can come out to the person's house. There are bereavement specialists to help the family that's going through the process of losing their loved one. Chaplains, if appropriate. Um, other kinds of volunteers who can come and help for example, to um, sit with the patient so that the loved one can get out of the house for an hour, things like that. 
um, social workers to really help the family and the loved ones to know about all of the um, costs and how, you know the programs available to pay for things, how to get a hospital bed into your, into your house for free, um, other things that you don't know that you need, um, all these things. So all these experts reach out and help and support the family through the process and help and support the patient through the process. The two principles guiding hospice care are that each patient is an autonomous person and that each patient gets to make their own decisions. Um, we have to respect their decisions. Now sometimes those decisions had to be made before they entered hospice care because sometimes when people are in hospice, they've actually moved into a, a phase of illness where they can't really make good decisions anymore. And so uh, some of these have to be things that were written down or it has to be the family members who make the decisions because the patient can't make them anymore. Um, family members and friends are supported through the process also. They get counseling before the death. Um, they're shown how to provide care during the, the, the illness so that they know um, how to safely and accurately dose or how to um, care for the patient's physical needs, things like that. And then there's help after the death. The grief counselors call and, you know, uh, the, once a person's on the hospice program, it's all the details for um, arranging for the body to be removed and all those things are taken care of. And so that the, the family doesn't have to think about those things um, because it is really traumatic to lose somebody after an illness. So um, all hospice really helps everybody, the patient and their family and their, and their friends. All right, so something that I alluded to a second ago is advanced directives. Advanced directives are a person's instructions for end of life medical care. And we, we have to write them before we really need the medical care. While we're not sick, we're not maybe altered. Um, sometimes it takes the form of a living will where um, we can um, give, the, give instructions about what kinds of medical in intervention we want um, if we become incapable of expressing those wishes. We've had cases recently where a person has um, had an accident and had um, significant brain damage, so now they couldn't speak for themselves. And their loved ones have to make those decisions if, they, if those decisions aren't written down. A healthcare proxy, proxy is where a person chooses to make medical decisions, uh, I'm sorry, a person is chosen to make medical decisions if one becomes unable to do so. So, you know, in, the event that I am in, incapacitated, I might write a healthcare proxy for my spouse or my children to make decisions. Um, so advanced directives come in a couple of different forms and they kind of um, have different functions or uh, focuses. So those advanced directives can be really helpful on this last part uh, on this topic, which is hastening or postponing death. Um, Passive euthanasia is where we stop giving med medical intervention to a person who um, is seriously ill or terminally ill so that they can just die naturally. So we just stop intervening. That's passive euthanasia. That palliative care and hospice care would fall under the category of passive euthanasia. We're no longer going to take dramatic steps to try and prolong this person's life. DNR stands for do not resuscitate. And this is a, an advanced directive, um, or it could be that there's a healthcare proxy who can make the request. And in this case, if the person's having a cardiac arrest or a respiratory arrest, the doctors are not going to attempt to resuscitate. So it has to be on file and it has to be, and a lot of times doctors uh, will resuscitate anyway out of fear that the DNR is not really on file with the hospital or, or things like that. So it's, um, it's only probably invoked about 25% of the time when a person actually has a DNR because there's a lot of risk to doctors if they don't do everything they possibly can and then it turns out there was no DNR on, on file. So um, this one's kind of a tricky one. And even trickier is active euthanasia, which is where someone takes action to bring about another person's death. So um, Cases would be, for example, a person who's um, so advanced in Alzheimer's that they are no longer really present and they're having a lot of, they're, they're in pain or other kinds of things, and then let's say their spouse gives them more pills than they're supposed to take, and then the person dies. Um, 
In some states, that's considered murder, and in other states, it's considered active euthanasia. In some states right now, we have physician-assisted suicide. And so this would be where a doctor provides the means for someone to end his or her, her own life. Now, the doctor doesn't do it. The doctor provides them the means, so gives them a prescription for a medication that will um, end their life. So the doctor is implicated. And so in some states, it's legal, and in some states, it's not. And um, there's oftentimes controversy surrounding active euthanasia. There was just a case recently in the Netherlands where um, active euthanasia was performed on an elderly patient who um, had said she was willing to consider it if it was if she felt like it was time. And then when the doctors and, and her family thought it was time, she said, I don't think it's time. And then they um, performed active euthanasia on her anyway. Um, those are the scary situations that makes people that make people think we've got to be really super careful about active euthanasia. Um, other people say, well, passive euthanasia prolongs people's suffering. So it's, it's an active debate. It's definitely something that um, different states are handling in different ways, different countries are handling in different ways. Attitudes towards end of life decisions. So um, this is from a study from 2007 where they asked Physicians who are in the blue bars, nurses in the red bars, family members in green bars, and patients in intensive care in the orange bars um, to answer these two questions. Regard the quality of life as more important than the length of life. Physicians and nurses were much more likely to think that the quality was more important than the length. Uh, family members were sort of intermediate, but the person who was actually sick did not agree with that statement at all. I, there, about half of them were like, no, I'd rather live a longer life. Um, would prefer not to be in a hospital if they were terminally, terminally ill. Interestingly, physicians were least likely to want to be in a hospital if they were terminally ill. Um, family members of sick people were the most likely. So there are some variations between what doctors and nurses think and what other you know, the people who's, who are sick or the people who are, whose family members are sick think about things. All right, let's go ahead and take a break here, and we'll come back and finish up with how we react to death.